Welcome back to The Dive. The New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission recently approved the first set of rules governing the state's adult use cannabis program. And today we're chatting with chairman of the board of TerraSend, Jason Wild, to discuss his thoughts on the New Jersey market, its recent acquisition with a Michigan-based company, the company's financial statement, and regulations about the cannabis space. But before we dive into it, tap that subscribe button for me, please. Hey, Jason, welcome back to The Dive. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be back. It's been probably about uh, six months or so, I think. Yeah, it's been too long. It's great to have you back. Okay, so let's start off with the company's big acquisition, Michigan-based Gage Growth Corp. Why Gage and why now? Uh, Gage is just one of the, uh, it, the top brands in, uh, and one of the dominant players in Michigan. Michigan is, a, it, first of all, Michigan's an awesome market. Uh, it's the third biggest market in the U.S. Uh, right now, uh, in terms of by, by the uh, on the state level, uh, and it's growing much quicker than the uh, than the top two. And there are virtually there's virtually zero presence in Michigan of multi, of the multi-state operators uh, because everybody because Michigan is an unlimited license state. So a couple of years ago, when uh, when it was really hard to uh, raise money, uh, even worse than you know the last the last few months, I would say uh, all of these. Uh, Larger operators said, "You know what? Let's take the cash we've got and use it for, uh, you know, um, for finishing what we're, we've already started building out, and let's focus the rest of the money on the limited license states." And they left Michigan wide open, and what I call the mom and pops, uh, they ended up going in and pretty much, you know, uh, taking Michigan themselves and and not having much outside uh, influence or outside uh, competition. And Gage became one of the leading brands. We don't have any official market share figures because uh, Michigan doesn't release uh, that, that type of data, but they are a figure, you know, I don't know if they're number one, two or three in, in Michigan, but I would say that uh, what I do know is that out of the top brands in Michigan, they are considered the highest quality in terms of the, the, their flower quality and, and their stores. Uh, and they're just, uh, they're sort of leading edge in terms of cool stores, great merchandising, you know, fun stores to, uh, to be in. And we just, we love them for their Michigan uh, presence and the fact that, that they're in this uh, steep growth curve in, in Michigan in terms of bringing on new, uh, new stores uh, and, and with improving margins because they're making more and more of their own stuff that they're selling in the stores. Uh, but what we also love about them is that we're gonna take uh, their expertise and their know-how and, and just their talent and integrate them into uh, into terror fully into TerraSend and uh, and you know go out and essentially you know try to uh, you know uh, take over the take over the country or do it uh, do it slowly and methodically but we feel like together we are uh, we're a much better company than than either of us are apart we're very very complementary to each other. All right, very cool. So, do you think that the early flower shortages in Michigan could lead to an Oregon type situation with compressed margins? I think that in Michigan, in these unlimited license states, you need to own, you know, pretty much the whole, uh, you need to be fully vertically integrated. Uh, if, if that happens, then you are much more well protected in terms of price, to, price swings on flour uh, than uh, if you're just a cultivator or just a retailer. Because uh, Michigan has gone through these, uh, as you pointed out, through these phases where it's either undersupplied or, uh, you know, then it gets oversupplied, like it did uh, towards the end of uh, the end of last year. If you're just cultivating flour, it's like uh, it would be like extremely difficult to forecast what you're going to do for the next uh, couple of years. But if you're selling all of that through your own retail stores, uh, retail prices don't have nearly the same volatility that wholesale prices do. So you're just uh, you're just much more protected, uh, and that's really uh, that's that's where Gage is now. They had actually not opened; they had held off on opening more stores till they were going to bring on more of their own capacity because they didn't want to be subject to those, uh, you know, those wholesale market swings. Uh, but now they are, uh, they're opening, they'll be opening up another 10 stores or so in the next, in the next several months. And since the vast majority is going to be supplied from their own cultivation, they don't have those, they, and, you know, they don't have the exposure in terms of having to buy it for their retail stores, but they also even more so don't have the exposure of what are we going to be able to sell this stuff to, 
uh, you know, the, what's the, what price are we going to get if we sell it to the wholesale market? Uh, because they're not, they're selling, you know, practically everything through their own stores. Okay, yeah, makes sense. So TerraSend Corp now owns 87.5% of TerraSend New Jersey. What can you tell us about the current state of New Jersey's market? Yeah, we're, we're very, very excited about Jersey. As, uh, as you probably know, it goes uh, uh, adult use or, or rec will be implemented in the next, uh, in the next few months. We're thinking in the, in the fourth quarter. And there's only right now, I think, 22 dispensaries in the whole state. And there you know, most likely won't be more than 30 by the time uh, you know, rec is implemented. Uh, and we just think it's going to be an awesome market. We will have three stores there. We have two open now. We're hopefully opening up our, our third uh, by mid-November. And we just think there's going to be a massive amount of demand uh, at our retail stores. We also just announced a couple of weeks ago that we uh, signed an exclusive deal with uh, Cookies to be uh, the exclusive uh, cultivator and manufacturer of their products in New Jersey, uh, as well as we're going to have these Cookies store within a store uh, in our apothecary and dispensaries there. So we think we're going to pull a, a, a huge amount of demand from not just New Jersey, but the whole tri-state area uh, to, our, to our stores. And we sort of, uh, uh, we're thinking more that we're going to be limited just by throughput. Like how many people can we get past the registers and, uh, uh, and you know, through, through the doors? But even from that perspective, where we've already, you know, we opened these stores as medical. Now they're going to be turning into rec. But we, we pretty much designed them knowing that we were going to have uh, uh, higher throughput uh, later. And uh, as an example, uh, our Maplewood store, we have uh, 16 point of sales. Like that, that shouldn't limit you in terms of getting people at least past the registers. Uh, you, you, know, you should be able to do over $60 million a year with, with, with uh, 16 point of sales. So anyway, point being, we're super excited about the retail aspect of it. And then on top of that, we have one of the largest cultivation and manufacturing footprints that we just uh, finished building out uh, in, uh, in northern Jersey. And we hope to be able to uh, both supply our stores uh, and supply the, uh, the wholesale market to a large extent, especially after we bring on uh, more cultivation uh, uh, next year. So it's going awesome. to be it's gonna be good. It's exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Yeah. OK, so you guys ended Q2 with 58.7 million U.S. dollars in revenue with 23.1 million US net loss. Can you give us your thoughts on the quarter? What should investors be watching moving forward? Sure, so um, the quarter was uh, marked by, you know, continual, con continued uh, sequential growth, uh, pretty much, you know, pretty for the last, uh, for the last two or three years. Um, the net loss, that, that's largely affected by, uh, by some uh, warrant uh, revaluation that we need to do every quarter and, uh, and, and some other, uh, uh, non-cash uh, items. So we usually uh, quote the uh, the EBITDA, uh, the adjusted EBITDA numbers, which are more in the uh, in the uh, twenty-three-ish million dollar range, I believe, or twenty-four. Um, and we had we were positive, uh, had positive cash flow for the quarter. Uh, we ended up uh, bringing online. New Jersey started to have some substantial uh, wholesale sales, uh, although. Under medical, obviously, uh, it's a completely different story than what we think is going to happen uh, once rec kicks in in a few months. Uh, Pennsylvania, we had uh, we had some issues related to our uh, expansion, uh, our cultivation expansion, which we uh, uh, have, uh, uh, which we told the street last week uh, or two weeks ago that uh, we've increased by fifty to sixty percent, or that we will have that increase by fifty to sixty percent by the end of the year, um, and. What happens is when you try to do a very large scale expansion, you end up bringing sort of a foreign, uh, uh, you know, or external uh, environmental uh, aspects into your facility. And when you're growing live plants, you have uh, often there's you can have issues related to that. And we had some issues around that. It's already uh, it's already been dialed in uh, in, the, in the last uh, in the last two months or so. But it impacted our revenue in Q2. And we said it'll in, impact our revenue in Q3 as well. Uh, and then uh, the other uh, aspects of the quarter were, uh, and, and overall, you know, we had a strong sequential growth, you know, huge year over year growth, really nice profitability, best in class, uh, I think, uh, or best in sector, uh, 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 adjusted EBITDA margins of uh, around 40%. Uh, so still driving very strong profitability, uh, but we're really looking forward towards, uh, you know, later this year and, uh, and, especially next year in 2022, when we bring on Jersey and 
when we have all of this extra capacity that we've just lived through a little bit of pain through in Pennsylvania. Uh, once uh, that's all finished, you know, by the end of uh, by the end of this year, the beginning of next year, we should really be, uh, you know, have some very large scale assets online and, uh, you know, producing uh, at, at scale. And we're 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 really excited about that. Are there any other states you find interesting? Do you see TerraSend remaining active with acquisitions in other states? Yes, we're going to continue to look at new states. Uh, the Michigan, uh, the, the Gage deal obviously uh, followed our strategy of wanting to go uh, deep in the states where we are. We don't want we we don't want to have a lot of uh, you know sort of flags on the map and say we're in uh, we're in twenty states. Uh, we'd rather uh, build and uh, build out our footprint. Uh, methodically and make sure that we're what we're doing is being uh, uh, and that we fo- that we fully have control and we're positioned to be successful in the places where we are before we uh, you know before we add something else uh, and with the gauge uh, transaction uh, we certainly get a large scale uh, operation in Michigan where we feel like uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna step in and be uh, and be the dominant player there we'll look at other assets uh, in conjunction with gauge. Uh, in other states, sort of uh, throughout the Midwest and the, and the Northeast. Uh, but we're also going to look at acquisitions uh, within the states where we are. Michigan, for example, it's an advantage that it's, uh, you know, an unlimited licensed state because, you know, uh, any operator there can acquire their way to, you know, 50 or 100 dispensaries over time. And that's a huge advantage over states like, uh, like uh, New Jersey or, or Massachusetts, where you can only have three dispensaries. So mm-hmm. we think there's going to be uh, a lot of M and A uh, activity and uh, some really attractive opportunities in Michigan. Same thing for Pennsylvania. You can get to 18 dispensaries. We currently have six, um, so we want to do that, and we're, we're probably going to want to add another state or two as well over the next year. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, so what are you watching on the federal level in terms of regulation? Do you think Biden has been a disappointment for cannabis investors? I think, yeah, I think the market is, is definitely telling us that that Biden has been a disappointment, uh, certainly. Uh, and maybe people got too overly optimistic when the, the Senate flipped in, uh, in January and we had sort of the, uh, the, that last big run in, in the stock prices. Um, but at this point, there has not been a lot of progress. I don't know if it's specifically Biden. I think people are disappointed that they got a Democrat who is like, you know, sort of uh, the most uh, anti-cannabis you, you could be uh, for being a Democrat. Uh, so they thought that he would, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe they would have hoped that he would have been more positive uh, for for legalization and uh, uh, and just, uh, uh, you know, uh, legalization, actually. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing is, it's really been more about, um, you know, the legislation in Congress that hasn't really moved that much. And um, I think, you know, in my view, uh, Schumer was sort of came out uh, and, you know, sort of asked for more so he can so he can step it back and uh, and make some incre- incremental progress uh the problem is i feel like i don't know uh, investors didn't uh, didn't they thought it was all going to happen like in three months and it didn't happen i think i think we're still going to have uh i think we should hopefully have uh uh the safe uh act legislation hopefully uh you know by uh sometime in the in the first half of next year uh in my view uh we don't need any of this uh, from a from a uh, company uh, point of view or any of the MSOs. I don't think we need legislation in order to con- continue to execute on our business plans. And I actually, my view is it it took five years or ten years to happen uh, that all of these companies that are currently operating it gives them a longer uh, you know period of time where they can go and quadruple or quintuple or more the size of their business. Uh, you know, say by the next five years. And then if you get the ability to list on a U.S. exchange, which also means that, you know, U.S. listed companies can buy into the space, you get a big uh, sort of jump in valuation or a re-rating uh, there from a much higher, you know, price. So personally, I think we make more money if it takes longer. Uh, but from the perspective of the fact that people are still getting arrested every day and are sitting in jail, you know, uh, from that perspective, I wish things would happen as quickly as, as possible. But it doesn't look mm-hmm. like uh, it doesn't look like it's happening. Yeah, not for at least uh, you know another ten months. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, so we've seen studies repeatedly refute claims that cannabis dispensaries are linked with elevated crime or increases in youth marijuana usage. What do you think drives this sentiment? 
and the sentiment that it increases crime. Yes, Is that, that's good. Yeah, um, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that it's uh, those are just people that uh, you know uh, have whatever biases they have, or have that you know ingrained uh, you know stigma from from growing up, uh, you know, uh, and and seeing all of the misinformation that was put out there. So I think I think mm -hmm. that that's it. I mean, we had a. Uh, We've had similar, uh, you know, when people have protest, protested against uh, our cultivation facility, they, you know, gone and put out flyers that say it's going to be a, a, a magnet for crime. Like what, what criminals, uh, or, or I'm sorry, a magnet for criminals, like what criminals are going to go hang around a, uh, a cannabis facility with, you know, full-time uh, security and, uh, and uh, you know, surveillance and all the rest. It's, it's, cra it's, 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 mm -hmm. it's craziness. I don't know if they if some of them actually believe it or they're just, you know, using it to scare other people into being afraid of it. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. All right, Jason. So one more thing before we let you go. Is there any social media uh, pages that our viewers can follow you on? Social media. Sure. Uh, I'm on Twitter. It's uh, Jason G. Wild is my uh, is my Twitter name. And I, uh, I spend probably spend too much time on there. So uh, if anybody uh, wants to. Uh, uh, go on there and follow me or send me a direct message or has some great opportunity for me to take a look at it. Be, uh, be happy to take a look. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the dive today, Jason. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all so much for watching. Now, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on your way out.